We love to ask, what is the greatest or who is the greatest? Sometimes it's, what's the, the greatest sports player? What's the greatest basketball player? LeBron or Jordan? What's the greatest, who's the greatest football player or, or soccer player we say here? Uh, Messi or Ronaldo? Who's the greatest, uh, ki- what's the greatest kingdom of the world? If we were to land, land up all the kingdoms in the history of the world, Oh, well, America has had the most power, but what about the Eng- England? They've had the most land. What about Rome? They reigned for the greatest amount of time. If you ask, what's the greatest president? Was it Lincoln? Was it Washington? Um, we won't name any other current ones. <laughs> So we like to ask the question, what is the greatest? Who is the greatest? What's the biggest mountain? What's the, the, who is the fastest runner? Who is the greatest at this and that? Well, we do the same with the Bible. What is the greatest commandment? It's a good question, right? It's a fair question. And so let's ask a, a what is the greatest question today. And let's see what the answer is from the Bible. Let's see, ask the greatest question, or the, what is the greatest commandment, and let's ask our Savior here. And so today we're going to look at verses 28 to 34. God willing, at this time, in the morning, we're going to look at verses 28 to 30. And then we'll do part two this evening, God willing, with verses 31 to 34. And so you, if you have an outline in your bulletin to follow along, and we're, today, in this morning, we're going to cover the scribe's good question and Christ's great answer. The first part of Christ's great answer. And then tonight, we'll look at the second part of great, Christ's great answer, the scribe's wise response, and the statement that you're not far from the kingdom. Okay, so verses 28 to 30 this morning. So we're going to see the scribe's good question. So in order to understand the, uh, the context, we're going to again look at the surrounding context and remember where we're at. If you remember, we're in the book of Mark, so we're switching from Second Corinthians from your regularly scheduled programming to fit in here now in the Gospel of Mark. Where are we in Mark? And so if you remember the book of Mark, it can be outlined like three books on a shelf with two little... Book stops, bookshelves, book um, whatever stops the books from falling over. Book ends. Thank you. And so we we have chapters one to the end of eight, more or less, is is giving the the Jesus's ministry in Galilee. The little book end that, that holds up that is the introduction, the the prologue that introduces us from John the Baptist in the first first verse, first verse, eight verses. The second book on the shelf is, is going to be Jesus' road to Jerusalem. So that t- takes m- more or less, it goes from chapters 9 to 10. And then we have 11 to 15 that's going to take us into Jerusalem and then all the way to the cross. And then the last bookend is going to be the resurrection in chapter 16. And so we're here now in this last book. This last book, the three books on the shelf, we're looking, we're on the road to, we are after the road to the cross, we are in Jerusalem. We are into Jerusalem, and if you flip through your pages in the Bible, you see in chapter 11, in verses 1 to 11, how Jesus comes in the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We see him come with the fig tree that is withered in verses 12 to the, about around 26. And in between there, Jesus cleansed the temple. And so Jesus cleansing the temple and this fig tree that he curses and withers is a great statement of the emptiness of the religion in Jerusalem and how it's a great uh, failure. It's a great failure to, to be. And so the fig tree that he curses is picturing the, the temple that he cleanses out. And how the religion is worthless. How the true temple is there and how he's rejected and cast aside. And so after this event, this puts the persecution on steroids. This puts the persecution is now from the religious leaders 
they're going to go out and all out attack on Jesus. And so they can't do that physically because he has the great movement of the crowds and the crowds are enjoying his, his teaching and they're crying, Hosanna. They're, they're thinking they're wanting a political kingdom to come and they're excited that, that there's a potential Messiah here in their eyes. And so we're picking up in the story. We begin in verse, chapter 11, verse 27, where we see the first of six confrontations. In verses 27 to 33, the, Pharisee, the chief priests, scribes, and elders, they come, and they come with an accusation of authority. Where do you get authority to do these things? And then in chat, Jesus responds, destroying their arguments and uh, establishing his own. In, verse, in chapter 12, verses 1 to 12, he begins to tell them a parable of the wicked vine dressers. And he does so, teaching them of their rebellion against his true authority. And then in chapter 12, verses 13 to 17, the Pharisees and the Herodians come, an unlikely matching, and they come together in order to try and question him, trap him, with a question about taxes. But Jesus masterfully refutes their arguments by describing the truth to them about giving to Caesar the things that are Caesar and God the things that are God's. Then the next attack comes from the Sadducees in verses 18 to 27. And they come about the resurrection, not believing in the resurrection, and Jesus masterfully opens the Old Testament and quotes how God spoke in verse 26, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. And so Jesus is in the midst of a, a battle. Jesus is in the midst of having religious leaders attack him, and he's doing so, and it's recorded for us so that we would worship him. We would worship Jesus Christ, and we would see from his great wisdom, his great explanation of truth. There's something that a difficult time or a controversy brings out that is worthy to be worshipped. And here we see Jesus Christ worthy to be worshipped as he makes the truth clear by allowing these controversies and allowing them. And so we have another, the fifth of the six controversies we focus in on. And we read in verse 28, the scribe's good question. Then one of the scribes came and having them and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well. He said, he asked, which is the first commandment of all? Go ahead and turn over to Matthew's account, and we want to fill in the details from Matthew's account in chapter 22. We'll pick up in verse 34. This particular story, we find it in Matthew and in Mark. It adds an interesting detail of the scribe's good question here. When it says in verse 34, Matthew 22, verse 34, But when the, the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them said, a, a lawyer at, asked him a question, testing him, and saying, Teacher, which is the great, the great commandment of the law, in the law? Okay, so coming back to Mark now. What we observe in Matthew is that there's been this meeting, this meeting of the Pharisees, and one of them... A lawyer volunteers to go, and he volunteers to test Jesus. So when we compare the two, it's a little difficult to, to how they go together, because one, in, Ma in Mark's account, we see the good side of this, this scribe, and then Matthew, we see the bad side of this scribe. And so putting these together, we can, we can observe that it's uh, how it may have gone together. Probably, it seems as though they went together the Pharisees coming together to plan to trap Jesus. Somebody says, I'll ask him a good question. I'll ask him a question and we'll see how he answers. And as this lawyer, this scribe, this expert of the law, we've seen who's coming now to him. And then we see why he asks. He asks with a mix of testing Jesus. But then what does Mark say? Again, in verse, in verse 28, perceiving that he had answered them well. 
he heard Jesus reasoning with all these other attacks in this day. We're, we're on Tuesday, approximately Tuesday or Wednesday of Passion Week. We're only a couple days from the cross. And so Jesus, this, this scribe, hearing Jesus respond to all these things, it seems as though Jesus has won over this scribe in some way, in some form. He originally coming to trap Jesus, and now he seems to be perceiving that he's answered all things biblically, all things well. So we're looking at who's coming. We're looking at why he's coming to Jesus. We're thinking about what he heard when he's hearing Jesus. He sees, he begins to see some of the sin in the, his own um, in his own group of the Pharisees. And so, you know when like a um, a baseball pitcher comes up to to throw a ball and he decides, you know, I'm just going to throw this one right down the plate. I'm going to throw it as fast as I can, but I'm just going to throw it down the middle of the plate and we'll see if he hits it. Out of respect, I, I, I won't throw it slow, but I'm, I'm going to see if I can throw it past him. But I want to see if he's going to hit it. And so this kind of way this scribe comes. With something evil, want to throw one by him, and yet something good. I'm going to see if he's going to hit it. I'm, going to give him, I'm not going to give him an attack, a trap question, where there's no good answer. I'm going to give him a good question. I'm going to give him a good question and see how he answers. And so it is a good question. It's not like a question uh, just trying to attack. It is a good question. And so, what is the question then? What is the question? And so, in verse 28, the question is, which is the first commandment of all? What is the top in the rank of questions? If we could rank all the questions by number, what would be number one? What is the greatest of the commandments? If we could take, they say, the scribes would say there's 613 commandments. 248 of them are positive. Do this. 365 of them are negative. Don't do this. What is the king of the commandments? What's on the top of the pile? What is the one that we're to look to? In, the, in Jesus' time, this was a common question. If you read in the Gospels in Luke 10, somebody else asked this question another time to Jesus. In another scenario. We have in rabbinical writings where they would debate and answer this question. From Rabbi Simeon, two centuries before, responding and writing about this question. Hillel, who was well known in the time, in the school, his school of Hillel, was asked this question. Someone came to him and asked this question, what's the greatest commandment? And if, he said, if you tell me in a short enough time, uh, in, in the way he asked it, he said, I'm going to stand on one foot. If you can tell me what the summary, the greatest commandment of it is, before I fall from my one foot. So tell me, tell me in a brief way, in a, in a succinct way, tell me what is the greatest commandment. And so we see here and we learn here about our religion from this commandment. We learn a great lesson by what is our greatest commandment as well. Okay, so now that we've seen verse 28... We've seen the scribe's good question. Let's begin to get into Christ's great answer. In verses 29 to 30. In verse 29 we read, And Jesus answered, The first of all the commandments is here, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. So here's the truth. Clearly stated. Let's begin to observe it. Let's begin to analyze it. Let's begin to meditate upon what Jesus says here. We love that Jesus is answering. And Jesus is answering clearly. He's answered much in a much shorter time than Hillel. We could hear his whole response while we're on one foot, right? So he begins by describing who God is, and then he describes how we're to live towards him. We are to love him. 
We are to love God. So first we look at who he is in verse 29. And then what we're to do in verse 30. Here's the fundamental heart of Judaism of the day. We remember this 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 call, the first of the, all the commandments. He's quoting Deuteronomy 6, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is the text that they would put in the phylacteries, or they put on the little boxes that they would wrap around their hands and around their head. This is the verse that they would put in a little box by the door. So the idea is, as you would... Look at the, the time, or look at your, your, your wrist. You would remember, as you would walk out the door, you would remember this great statement of who God is. And it would call to your mind these great, this great commandment as well. That we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind. Devout Jews still recite this verse, the morning and evening. So what is it describing? This great declaration is it is describing who our God is, using His covenant name, Yahweh, to describe the audience who should be listening. Hear, O Israel! Hear, O Israel! The Lord our God, the Lord is one. What's in a name, right? What's in a name? This name is communicating here. That God is one. He is self-existent. He is the only one who has existed. We've, we've talked before about his aseity. About how God is the one who is the only one who exists. Who has always existed. And he doesn't look to anything else as creator. Everything else looks to him as creator. Everything else has their source in him. Whether it's an angel, a mountain, or the ground beneath our feet, the stars of the sky, all of the universe finds its, its origin in Him. That He is the only one who is self-existent. This name communicates His sovereignty. That be, because He has this place... He is the only one who decides what happens in all of history, in all of his world, with all of his creation. He's the one who rules and reigns over everything he's made. Absolute authority goes to him. Absolute history is his. All that exists, whether spiritual or physical, is his. All that exists, whether philosophical, or whether laws of logic or math that we discover. It is all His, and from Him, and to Him are all things. And so because He's self-existent, because He is the one that is sovereign and king over all this universe and all of time, He's the one... Who we must be careful how we worship. We must worship as he described we were to worship him. We must not use any sort of created image in order to worship him. Because if we use any image, if we use any thing of creation to try and worship him and say, like Israel, here's an image, worship your God by this image in order to help you. That is a lie. It's a lie, and we're telling a lie about who God is. Because we're holding up a creature of any sort or fashion, whether it's a, a painting of a saint or whether it's a, um, a statue of a, a calf. Or, and we're saying, worship your God. But we're telling a lie about who this God is. And so this name is communicating many things. It's communicating God's self-existence. It's communicating God's sovereignty. It's communicating His covenant relationship with His people. When He declared it, this is a name He's saying that this name is for you, my people. It is not for all. Like my name, uh, like Benjamin will hear other people say, Pastor Marcos. And so sometimes in the house he'll say, oh, Pastor Marcos. And I'll say, no, 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 that's not... That's not my name. What's my name? And it is Daddy. 
It's a name that only he can, he can have. It's a name for him. And so Yahweh in the in the declaration of the, the Shema is communicating that his covenant people, his people may have this name. And it communicates his fidelity, his faithfulness to them. Many things that this communicates to us. And when we think about how all sovereignty is his and all existence um, is from him, it means that we owe him much. We owe him our existence. We owe him our love. You exist because he declared that you would exist. All authority that we have is authority derived from him. So if you have authority in your job, you have authority at your home as a mother or a father, you have authority in the government, you have authority in the church, you derive that authority from him. Because all sovereignty and all authority comes from him. And so all, all the authority that we have needs to be faithfulness to him. And it also, in this great declaration, it communicates that the Lord our God is one. We don't worship three gods. We worship one God. I remember S. Lewis Johnson in a sermon in this in a sermon about this text describing how in Deuteronomy the words is being used in Hebrew is is communicating a compound unity that he could have in Moses or God in this declaration could have could have used a other words that would describe an absolute unity. In other words, uh, um, what we're com- what's described here in a subtle use of the language is that it allows for three persons. And so, but we have one God. We don't believe in tritheism. We don't believe that there are three gods and that we worship three Father, Son, and Spirit as three separate gods. There is God is one essence revealed in three persons. And so if we were asked, like in the children's catechism, are there more gods than one? The children should answer, no, there is, only, there is only one God. If we ask the children, in how many persons does this one God exist? What should the children answer? In three persons. So, we want to teach this idea to our children, right? This great declaration that there is only one God. We don't believe in modalism. We don't believe that God, this one God comes in different forms. That's another lie about who God is. We don't worship three gods and we don't worship a God, one God that shows up in different forms. In other words, the Father becomes the Son and the Son becomes the Spirit. Like you have a cube of ice here who becomes it becomes a liquid and the liquid becomes a vapor. And it's just the same water that turns into different forms. No, we have uh, three persons in one substance. Three persons in one power, one eternity. Charles Simeon said that these three persons do not act independent of each other. Like tritheism, tritheism would be three separate persons acting independent of each other. And so we have one God. So we've seen who's coming. We've seen why he's coming. We've seen what he asks. We've seen who the God that we're to love is. The, the one true and living God. And so here, O Cornerstone... Here, O Cornerstone, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And so what does he call you to do? He calls you to love him. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. We see the second part, which God willing will, the second part of this one commandment, there's two parts of the of the one commandment. The second part says that you shall love your neighbors yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. 
And so he says these, plural, in verse 31, and then he says um, singular in verse 30, this is the first commandment. So this one commandment has two parts to it. The first part, love God. It's a pretty simple thing, right? Simple to say, simple to write. It's a lot harder to do. <laughs> easy, easy to think about. Yeah, love God. You can go home, talk to some of your family. What do you learn at church today? Oh, I love God. It sounds like the kid's answer, right? Let's, let's begin to meditate upon it. And it's the depth of it that humbles us and teaches us um, the important lessons. The simplicity of it we enjoy and we like. The depth of it is difficult and profound. In verse 30, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Okay, so here's a definition. I'm going to give you a definition of love from Stuart Scott, and I want you to write it down. I'm going to say it slow, and I'm going to um, repeat it so that you can write it down. And then I'm going to expound the definition in order to help you think about what it means, what, what Jesus is saying here. So here's the definition. Love is a selfless and enduring commitment of the will. A selfless and enduring commitment of the will to care about and benefit another person. To care about and benefit another person by righteous, truthful, and compassionate thoughts, words, and actions. So once more, love is a selfless and enduring commitment of the will. To care about and benefit another person by righteous, truthful, and compassionate thoughts, words, and actions. This is a comprehensive commandment. Jesus is saying, this, all the law is going to hang on this. Why is this the greatest commandment? Because this commandment... To love God, to have a selfless and enduring commitment of the will to God, to care about God and benefit God with righteous behavior, with righteous thoughts, with truthful, righteous, truthful, and compassionate thoughts, words, and actions. To act this way towards God is above all other goods in this life. To do this is greater than all other pleasures. There's nothing in comparison to God. And so to love Him above all else is the greatest good. That's why this is the greatest commandment. It's the greatest good. Why is it the greatest commandment? Because when you look in time, before all of time, before God made the world, this commandment stood as the persons of the Trinity loved one another with a perfect love. So this commandment is the greatest because it is greater than all others. God is greater than all other things. And He is, and it's greater because we, when we look at time, it is the oldest of the commandments. It is the greatest because it has, uh, God has the greatest value. And to love Him above all, of all else says to everyone else, he's the one of greatest value. He's the one of greatest worth. He's the one who's worthy of worship. This is the greatest commandment because to not do it is the greatest sin. The greatest sin is not to love God and not to love your neighbor. The second part of this greatest commandment. Do you do good and believe what is right only out of duty and not out of true love? You understand, we can, our obe sometimes we will obey, and sometimes we will obey with all, our, all, our, all that we can. And then when we look in the mirror, we look at that obedience, and that obedience is not all that God commanded it to be. Yes, we can have, have done something right and done something good, done something holy. But even as we look at the, the perfect standard of the law 
And then look at our obedience. Our obedience is not sufficient to this perfect standard of what God is calling us in His greatest commandment. It does. It takes all our efforts. All the moral uh, force that we can muster here. When Jesus says that it needs to be done with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. Jesus is not here describing four completely other um, departments here. As if we have a department of the soul and a department of the mind and a department of the strength. And No, he's describing overlapping terms here. That are describing with all of our effort, with all of our being, with every part of us, we need to love God. We need to put our minds into it and think all that we can about God. Doesn't Pastor Rick push you to do that? Uh, he, he doesn't think the way I think. And so when he's describing things, it pushes me when I listen to his sermons. It pushes me to think a different way and to exercise my mind to love God. You gotta love him with all your soul. You gotta love him with all your heart. Everything in your mental faculties, everything with your body, all the strength that you've been given, with all of the emotion that you have, is to be given towards God. He wants you to love him sincerely. When you look at all these parts with integrity, he doesn't want to fake. It's something that only he sees in 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 some aspects about your your love for him. Why are you here today in this building? Did you come for him? Did you come to hear his voice? Did you come to hear his word? Did you come to pray to him? You must love him supremely above everything else. You must love him constantly at all times, at all hours of the day. When you wake up and when you sleep. With all of your inner life, with all of your will, you have to love him in a selfless way. You're going to have to deny yourself. That's the greatest commandment. Here, to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And you're going to have to look at yourself in the mirror, and when you desire something, you're going to to love Him, you'll have to say no. You'll have to be enduring with it. It's going to be difficult. You have to persevere with it. You will have to be committed by your will. Your will will have to have an iron grip upon God and say, I will love Him above all else. You have to care about Him, His desires, His will, His plans. What would benefit Him above yourself, above others? Only then, when you do that, make that commitment to Him, can you help others, can you love others. You must be guided by Him in the way He wants to be loved. How does He want to be loved? What is a righteous way to love Him? He tells us by giving the rest of the law. The rest of the moral law is communicating to us how he wants to be loved. He says not to have any other gods. He wants you to love him by in that way. That is love for him. That your true object of worship, what you truly exalt in, what you truly love above all else, is him. You must worship him as holy, holy, holy. You can't use a graven image. You can't use a, a, some sort of um, image to worship him. You can't describe how you feel about him. You, you must use the Bible and the words that he has given that describe him in a way that our mind can see and not our eyes. That's how he wants to be loved. 
He wants you to love him by revering his name. Using his name in a holy way. Not saying, oh my. But not only not committing a blasphemy with his name, but he wants you to speak about him wherever you go. To seek to glorify him in conversations at all times. He wants you to remember this day. He wants you to remember one day out of seven and set it aside. He wants to be loved by name. He wants to be loved by the correct understanding of who he is. He doesn't want you to replace him with something else, with another uh, a God or another idea of career, money, or family, or any other thing. And he wants you to, his, to have his time. He wants you to set aside this time here today. To worship Him with all your heart, and all your soul, and all your mind. You have to ask yourself, do you love truths about God? And defending truths about God more than loving God? You must love the truths about God in order to love God. There's no other way to know Him apart from His Word. You must love defending Him. It's necessary and we're called to. And apart from that, we will lose the truths about God. But what are these things? Why do these things exist? Why do we defend the truth? Why do we love truths about God? So that we may love Him. It is very easy to do something religious. It's hard to actually love God as you do it. It's easier to read your Bible, it's easier to come to church. It's easier to pray than it is to love God. You can do all those things and out of ritual and not love God. This greatest commandment, this greatest commandment is beautiful to look at. It's hard to put on. It is hard to put on. You come to church, but do you love Him? You pray. Do you love him? You evangelize. But do you love him? You give. But do you love him? Many times to the commandment shines like the sun or something that reflects the sun. When you say the commandment reveals a light that blinds me, that blinds me, that shows me my sin. Without loving him, you can do no other commandment, truly. All other good works without loving him are not good works. It doesn't matter how much you say you love people. If you don't have true, um, the true God with true doctrine and love Him truly in a true way with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, you can do no other good thing. But once we love Him truly, we have the heart to obey all other commandments. We can say truly, what great things the Lord has done for me and how he has had mercy and compassion upon me. The gospel is what gives us that heart to truly love him. We don't love him perfectly. And the gospel reveals that to us, that we do not love him perfectly. So this is what we have to look at today. These are the truths described with a good question. The application is key. We will need to spend more time now to move away from the exposition, away from what it says. Now, for me to take more time to say, what is it? How should it apply to you? Because leaving the cold commandment here will only send you to hell. This commandment just laid out before you, like I said, is beautiful to look at. Like a uh, like a like a, a beautiful set of clothes that once you put it on, 
You can't bear the weight of it. It may look nice. It may even look nice on someone else. But then once you try and put it on yourself, you find yourself hopelessly unable. So how should we apply this? If this is the cold truth, that you're to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, how should you apply it? Four ways. Four ways. Write them down. One, it shows us who God is. Two, it shows us our sin. Three, it shows us our need for a Savior. And fourth, it gives us the guide of how to live. So first, it reveals how who God is. When you look at this commandment, that we're to love Him above all else, what does it teach us about God? That God would give us this commandment, and He would say, this one, this one is the greatest one. Well, it says something about God. It says that He is deserving of love. It says that it is our greatest good, that it would be the, our, the greatest good in our lives if we love Him above all else. Because of how worthy he is. For anyone else to say, love me, it would be egotism. It would be selfishness. It would be a, a perversion. But because God is the one who deserves all love and we exist for him, it is our greatest good that he would give us this command because he is the greatest good. It tells us that he is the one who's worthy of all love. Beyond our understanding. He's worthy of love because of his greatness. It's, this commandment shows us his authority. This commandment shows his holiness. This commandment shows his purity. This commandment shows his wisdom. And how to uh, show love to us. By giving us the commandment to love him. This commandment show, displays his omniscience. His truthfulness and his faithfulness. His sufficiency, His kindness. He, it shows He's our captain. He's our prophet. We hear the truth from Him. He's our priest. He's our king. He's our redeemer. He's humbled Himself to become our brother in humanity. He is the husband to the church. And He is worthy of all love. When a man looks at Christ, when a man looks at the, the means that God has given to love him. The Word of God. When a man looks at the Word of God and says, ah, it's not worth reading. When a man looks at church and says, ah, it's not worth going. When a man looks at God and says, ah, he's not wa worth worshiping. That says more about the man than it does about God. Like, I don't know anything about art. Like, I heard this is a great museum in Paris. I probably never go there. Never, go, But I've heard it's really good. What is it, the Louvre? Is that what it is? Yeah, that's how you say it? So then, what, what's there? Uh, the Mona Lisa and the, some of the greatest works in the history of the world, right? So if I go there and I say, ah, oh, that painting looks like, I think Benjamin painted something that looks like that. And I walk around and, it said, and I say, why there's no arms on this statue? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever to me. And I walk through at the, at the end and I say, you know, that was a waste of time. What is, that says more about me than it does about the art. I, I'm ignorant about those things. I wouldn't know a good work of art if it hit me in the head. So I need to be informed. I need to be taught. I need to learn what is good and what is right and why there are things in there are worthy to be looked at. And so it's the same with us and God. For us to say, in our cold hearts, you know, I'm happier if I worship something else. I don't believe God. I don't believe that. When you believe the lies of sin, it says more about you than it does about God. God is worthy to be esteemed, worshipped, and loved above all other things. And so this describes who our God is. And so what does it say about us? What does it say about us? You were given the ability to love 
because you were to love him. He made you for this purpose. You are different. You are not an animal. You are different than the animals. And so he's given you this very ability so that you would love him. His great worth of God, the commandment reveals God's great worth, but then it reveals your great sin. If I were to come today and tell you, you are guilty, guilty, uh, guilty of the worst sin that God has described as the worst sin. You have not loved him with all your soul, with all your might. The commandment crushes you. It must crush you. When you look at your own life, your own life is a history of not obeying this commandment. When you look in your mind, when you look in your soul, when you look at your what you've used for your strength, you have not obeyed this commandment for one day. One 24-hour period. You have not obeyed this commandment for this sermon, the entirety of this sermon. You have not obeyed this commandment. Can you do obey it for 15 minutes? Can you obey this commandment for five minutes? Can you love him with everything in your being? With all of your soul, all of your might, all of the time. And even do it for five minutes straight? Without an evil thought? Without a prideful thought? Without sin? It's easy to come to church and slide into church mode and conform. Conform to the culture, conform to uh, what everyone else is doing, and, and try and posture yourself as someone righteous. We're not here to pretend that we're righteous. We're not sitting here together to pretend like, oh, we're better than the people who were at the club, or, or we're not. We're here to hear the truth. And the truth is, we're not. We are guilty of the greatest sin in the Bible. And so what does this commandment tell us? This commandment not only tells us who God is, it not only tells us what our guilt is, this commandment tells us about our need for Christ. This commandment teaches us about our Savior. When Jesus came and took on flesh, he loved the Father. He loved the Spirit with all of his soul, with all of his might, with all of his strength, all of the time. In every word he did, in every action, in every thought. He was righteous in every way that you failed. Look at 1 John 4, verses 9 to 10. About two years ago, I preached a sermon on, the, on these texts. And uh, we just want to remember how this commandment points us to these truths again. In 1 John 4... We read in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Look at how God's love is manifested. Look at how God's love is revealed in verse 9. 
It's revealed towards us by Him sending His only begotten Son. The Father has loved us even though we did not love Him. What love is this? That we can live through Him that He would send a righteous Son who would be the propitiation for our sins. He would take the wrath of God that we deserve. We have not loved Him because you have committed the greatest sin. You deserve for God to abandon you. You deserve for God to leave you alone. You know, when someone has hurt you in your past and you have said, I won't spend time with them. I will be away from them. They are hurtful and they are unloving. God should have done the same with you. You have committed the greatest sin against him. More than anyone has committed against you. God should have abandoned you to be left to your depravity, to your idolatry, and to, you, to live in the disobedience to the greatest commandment. But look at his love. Look at the love that he didn't abandon you. Rather, he pursued you by sending his only begotten son. This great commandment not only displays God's righteousness, and not only displays our sin, but this God himself puts this commandment on display. God himself loves in a perfect way. Because he loves, he must judge all sin. And so today, are you found in him? Are you, do you find your hope in him? This, this text, this great commandment, reveals your sin. Whether you feel guilty or not, whether you see it or not, it is reveals your sin. It reveals you are a guilty sinner and God is a righteous God. So stop and admit the truth that you need a Savior. And Christian, you need to live off the gospel. You need to live off of these truths. When your own sin is revealed, that you don't love God as you should, Christian, where will you find hope and comfort? You must find hope and comfort that God loves the sinner and sends his son for the sinner. We find our hope in the gospel. Not simply in our own, the strength of our own repentance. And so we, we sing and we say glory to his name. We say glory to our Savior. We say what love has he poured out on us. What great things he has done for us. And how he has had compassion on us when he should have abandoned us. And yet he died, he sends his son to die on the cross in our place. And only by this work, by taking the wrath of God in that place and in that time as a substitute for, for us, those of us who believe upon him, those of us who repent of our sin, we have this great hope. In his love in the gospel, it's the freest love. No one made him do it. He didn't have to do it. He took the initiative. He made the plan. He wrote the gospel. He came personally. His love is the truest love. There is no hypocrisy in it. In every percentage, a hundred percent perfect. His love is the strongest love. No one has had a love like him. His love is the surest love. It's, it's displayed in what he has done, in what he is doing for you now, and what he will do in the future. And Christian, you know many of those gospel truths of what he has done, what he is doing now, and what he will do. How he has justified, how he is sanctifying you. How he is interceding for you. How he will glorify you. How he, you, he will hold you fast to the end. 
And so thinking about how to apply this great commandment, thinking about how to apply this great, great commandment, we are informed how to worship our true God and who he is. We learn who God is. We learn who we are. And we are guilty of the greatest sin. We learn about the gospel. The commandment drives us to Jesus. The commandment uh, teaches us, go to Jesus, go to Jesus, go to Jesus. And then the commandment gives us light for our lives. You want to follow Christ, do you? You want to be a Christian, do you? Well, start this way. Continue this way. Grow this way. Love Him more. Love Him more. Don't just pray. Pray and love Him. Don't just evangelize. Do it and love Him. Don't just come to church. Do it and love Him through these things that He's given to you in order to love Him. Humble yourself. Ask yourself. Where are the areas where I can grow in love for God? Is it work? Is it school? Is it my family? Is it church? Is it in private? Is it in prayer? Is it in public? Is it in witness? Where? Ask God to show you by His Word and by the counsel of others, where can you grow? Where can I grow in love for my God? Plead with Him in prayer. If you don't feel any guilt from this sin, then plead with God to reveal it to you. Because you need God to show you in your own soul, in your own life, your own sins, so that you may grow. So that you may love Him. We are never done with this commandment. We all must um, desire to grow. And the Christian desires to have the light of the law to guide us in this. In the true faith, when we are truly saved, when we truly repent and believe, we are given a true love for Him. And it is the mother of fruits in the Christian faith. It, or it, is, the, um, it is the most beautiful of the fruits to love Him with all your heart and with all your soul. And our love is not a perfect love, but it is a true love. It is a true love. And that's what changes from a false Christian to a true. It changes to it to be a true love for Jesus Christ. We're able to obey this truth in difficult times, um, in pain. We're able to obey God, I'm sorry, we're able to obey God in trials because we love Him. We're able to obey Him because we're in pain because we love Him. And so I say again, what great things the Lord has done for you and had compassion upon you. Shouldn't we grow in desiring for, the, for Him to come back? Covering all, for a lot of Sermons on eschatology, right? And classes on eschatology. How do you apply this commandment in these the, in eschatology? You are to desire His presence. To desire for Him to come back with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. It is your duty. It is your privilege to love Him. It is your honor to love Him. It is... Uh, um, it makes you wise if you love Him. It makes you excellent if you love Him. The best thing that they, somebody could say about you is that that person loves God. It is your necessity to love Him. You must do it. It makes you useful to Him. You become useful to the body when you love Him. Useful to others and useful to Him. It is your greatest delight. Christian, nothing would make you happier than to love Him more. You are made to love Him, and so loving Him will make you the happiest Christian. And by His Spirit, He has, by His work in your soul, in true salvation, 
He has made you able to love Him truly now in salvation. And so ask yourself, meditate upon Christ and His person. You want to grow in love for Christ? Meditate upon Jesus and His work. Read the Scripture and focus on Jesus Christ. And focus on the Gospel. And you will grow in love for Him. Pray that you would love Him more. Trust Him and you will love Him more. Depend upon the Spirit and you will love Him more. Obey His commandments. That is how He wants you to love Him. Jesus said, If you love Me, you will keep My commandments. Love Him by obeying His Word. Love Him by hating sin. Love Him by growing in, in sincerity, willingness at all times to love Him. Discipline, say no to, your, to the sin that comes up in you in order to love Him. This is, my, this is my counsel to you to love Him. And so looking back, to summarize, we've seen this, this, this confrontation, this fifth of the six confrontation passages in Mark. We've seen who comes to him, and, ask, and we see what question he asks. We've seen why he asks. We've seen what Jesus says is the greatest commandment. To see who God is, and to love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, with all your strength. We've seen that this commandment shows us who God is. We've seen this commandment condemns us as guilty of the greatest sin. And we see that Jesus is the one who has obeyed this in the greatest way in the gospel. And all our hope is in Him. And we've seen how this commandment sheds light on how we are to live in every day, in every way. This commandment is beautiful. Hear it with the gospel truth. Hear it how it with the gospel so let's re repent again, believe in the gospel again, and grow in our love for our great God. Let's pray. Great God, we don't love you like we should. We long to be with you. We long for you to come back. We long to be glorified so that we would love you perfectly. Today, at this moment, is not the day. We're not the time. We hope and pray that it would, you would come back. And so we pray, help us, Lord. Help us to see your great worth, that you're worthy of love. Help us to grow in this. Help us to see our own guilt. Help us to admit it and not run away from it, but to admit that we've not loved you like we should. Help us to find our hope for forgiveness, not merely in, in trying to love you more, but in re putting our hope in the gospel, our trust in what you've done on the cross. Help us, Lord, to repent and grow in love for you. Help us to be guided by this great light that this is what you want from us, to love you. And help us as to love you in, all, in your word by guided by your commandments. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you that we've set aside this time. Help us to love you now in the baptisms. Help us to love you in the rest of this day. Help us to love you as we talk and encourage one another. Help us to love you. Um, through your word and us speaking your word to one another. Thank you, Lord, for this time and this time of worship. We say all the, we pray this way so that you would be loved. Amen.